And so I took the bibliography that I showed you, and I tallied up the number of publications per year about Mexican birds. And that's what it looks like. It's the picture of the scientific literature. Boom, it's growing, right? But here's a really interesting thing. If I split it up by Mexican authors versus foreign authors, back in the 1800s, essentially all of the authors were foreign. European, North American. You can see into the 20th century that rate falls. And look, this is the proportion of authors who are Mexican. And that rises. Okay, so essentially what you see in terms of collections and biodiversity data, but also in terms of uh, the scientific output, is that Mexico ends up essentially taking its own destiny into its own hands. Farther along that evolutionary pathway is Conabio. This is Mexico's equivalent of Sanbi here in, here in South Africa. But essentially it's a huge compilation of data and of information about Mexican biodiversity. And you can see it goes from genes to species to ecosystems to all of biodiversities. Biodiversity, it goes from sites to corridors to regions to country to planet. And there's a lot of depth behind each one of these pictures. There's data, there's uh, imagery, and there's information. So my assertion in all of this is that knowledge is power. Essentially, I'll call knowledge primary research grade data. That knowledge really lends a massive amount of power in terms of uh, the academy, which is to say generating knowledge, but also policy, which is to say applying that knowledge to, to meaningful things. So just to sum up a bit, biodiversity informatics is a very complicated field. Maybe I'll call it bioinformatics sensulato. Goes from genotype through phenotype to kind of organismal things and then out to the environment and human influences. And so this whole spectrum is what we're talking about in some sense when we talk about biodiversity informatics. Um, this is another way of, of showing the same thing, but essentially you can see the, the unitary biodiversity databases, portals by which users can see those data, but then all sorts of analysis um, essentially views into these data. It might be the sort of things that we're gonna do in this class, looking at species richness and survey gaps and things like that. It might be genomic data, phenotypic data, environmental data, but where we're really gonna learn things is when we put together information across those realms. So I started out saying that kind of biodiversity informatics is, is something without a brain, which is to say we don't always know what the meaning of the field is. I would assert to you that in the first decades of its formal existence, biodiversity informatics has been run by data availability and technology. And that those two things have driven the ideas and concepts that people are looking at. So essentially, I have a hammer. Now where's something that needs to be nailed, right? That's not a good way to do science. Rather, what we should be doing is coming at science with ideas and concepts that are important to us. And those should drive the data that get created and developed and the technologies that are needed. So we kind of need to reorient this field. There are a lot of players. Um, you guys have certainly seen these initiatives and probably 50 more, okay? We just did a course last week that was about biodiversity initiatives and essentially how you should 
and how you should not separate, set them up, how you should and how you should not design them. Some of these things, some of these initiatives on this page are real meaningful efforts to provide data and knowledge to a community and some of them are what we call smoke and mirrors. It looks interesting and then it disappears. I'm being good. I didn't point to particular ones on the screen and say this versus that. So just to give you some general thoughts about biodiversity informatics, there should always be a focus on primary data versus secondary data. Always. Primary data are data that are essentially ready to roll for research. Secondary data are somehow interpreted. Something subjective is in there. It could be a range map instead of known occurrences. Okay? We always want to see research grade data versus play grade data. Think about it when somebody emails you a photograph or when you email somebody a photograph. It says, do you want to send the full size or do you want to send something small? Okay, it's kind of that way with data. Do you want all the detail? You know, maybe looking at that photograph, I don't care about the picture of whoever was in the picture. Maybe I care about the plant that's in the background. If it's a 15 megapixel picture, I can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in and see it. But if it's a thumbnail that I just send essentially for play, I can't do anything with it. So we want that full research grade information. And we want genuine improvements to infrastructure and not, again, that smoke and mirrors. Something that looks fascinating and disappears. Has no substance. Already talked about this a bit, but essentially, Primary biodiversity data are much preferred because there's no subjectivity. The assumptions, if there are assumptions, the assumptions will be stated. There's no interpretation, and perhaps most importantly, there's no information loss. Research data, research grade data, essentially we don't want our data to be dumbed down like that small version of the photograph. Um, basically, without that full fundamental access, we have no power to produce detailed policy reports. We have no power to produce meaningful scientific publications. So it's either research grade and primary or it's nothing. And then if we're really going to make a difference to the infrastructure, and you guys are part of this, Okay, that infrastructure has to have all these qualities, effective, efficient, based on research grade data, has to be sustainable, we don't want it to go away. So for example, we sent you guys links to some tools. I didn't have to think about whether Estimate S would still be online, okay? And for any of these initiatives, I don't want to have to think about that. That should be a permanent part of our toolkit. Reliable, publishable, novel, and inspiring. Okay, we should get excited about this. Maybe by the end of this week, you're gonna be dragging because we're gonna hit you with five long days of pretty dense instruction, and it's gonna be five separate topics. Okay, but hopefully in the course of this week, one of us or two of us will say something that you really find exciting. So that's essentially what this course is. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I'm gonna be good, maybe. Uh, here's an example of not. National Science Foundation grant, $463,000 for the development of Map of Life, an infrastructure for integrating global species distribution knowledge. Sounds exciting, okay? So I looked up a very African example, Afropavo, 
I don't think we have anybody from the Congo, but essentially this species is endemic to the DRC. Um, and it brings up five data sets. Here's some data from GBIF, and I have no idea what those are. I won't say what they are just to avoid getting myself into trouble. But what I want you to notice is I've got some data. Those are points, and I'm going to assume that there are ancillary data as well. When, who, what habitat, how much it weighed, all sorts of stuff like that. But then notice these maps, these polygons. This one is really simple, see that? And then this one's all got all sorts of detail. What do those maps mean? Has the species been found here, 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 here? All of those sites? The GBIF data show me only about a dozen sites. What about this area where one is saying yes and another is saying no? That site is only in the gray area but not in the green area. Why do those disagree? What assumptions went into developing those different maps? So that's all very opaque to me. To me, that's secondary data. But worse yet, and I've looked and I've looked and I've looked, and if anybody can find it, please tell me, and I will say I'm sorry. I've looked everywhere, and what I can't find is a way to download these data. So maybe we're interested in the distribution of Afropavo. And maybe we want to do some research project about the endemic birds of the Congo Basin. I want those maps. Where do I get them? National Science Foundation invested $463,000 in this project, and I can't get any data out of it? Isn't something wrong? Again, I promise, if one of you goes to Map of Life and can find the download button and can get those data out, I will say I'm sorry, I promise, okay? But to me, this is secondary data, and to me, this is showing people pretty pictures. That's a cool map, and it has no substance. So does the initiative work to make your research, your policy recommendations, whatever it is you do, does it make it more effective? That's the question. That should be the crucible. Okay, where you boil down everything you see in this field and decide whether you like it or you don't. Well, this is going on forever, isn't it? Summing up, new area of inquiry, lots of activity, lots of motivations, but some of those motivations are wrong. Again, we don't want to be the hammer looking for a nail. We don't want to be smoke and mirrors. Instead, we want to be things that really make a difference and understanding the world of biodiversity. So that's kind of an introduction to the whole field. Okay, we're going to go into a lot more detail on one little piece of it. 